Hello people from the future, welcome to Ramalize Nerd. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about GLOAF model for word embeddings. Now I have talked about word to vec model previously and in this video, I'm gonna be differentiating between these two and I will show you how we actually compute the word vectors for GLOAF model. Now if you are new to my channel, then please subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon if you haven't done already. I make videos about machine learning and data science regularly. So let's get started. So to understand this video to the fullest, I will highly recommend you to watch my previous videos on this NLP topic, especially the what to bake video. Because in that video, I have explained the basic concept of word embeddings and how we get the benefit of word embeddings while implementing NLP models. Now, I have discussed the different types of word embeddings and today I'm going to be focusing on this GLOAF model. Well, this GLOAF is actually an abbreviation for global vector and this was invented by a group of Stanford researchers and obviously I'm going to be linking to that paper in the description. So, make sure to check the description to know more about it. So, what is the difference between what to vec model and GLOAF model? Well, the basic difference between these two models is that in our previous model, we were only considering the local property of our data set. But in this GLOAF model, we are going to be considering the global property of our data set. That's why the global vectors. Okay. So in the previous model, we had two methods, right? First one was continuous bag of words model and the second one was skip gram model and in those cases we were either predicting the target word from its context window or we were predicting the context words from the target word okay so in a sense it was only considering the local property but in the glove model we are going to be taking advantage of the whole data set and one of the best ways of getting intuition from the whole data set that is taking advantage of the statistics from the whole data set is by using co-occurrence matrix or simply the count matrix. So to understand the count matrix, I'm going to be taking an example. And this is a very small corpus consisting of two documents. This is the first one. This is the second one. And the first one says, I love NLP. And the second one says, I love to make videos. Okay. So now we are going to be building the count matrix or the co-occurrence matrix now to build the count matrix i'm gonna be taking a window size of one and this count matrix is actually a counter for the context words for example uh, we are gonna increase the count whenever we find one word in the context of the other so to compute the count matrix from this thing Suppose at a general instance, I have this word at the middle and in the right, I'm taking one word and in the left, I'm taking one word. Okay. So at this instance, I'm going to be incrementing the count of I in the context of love and the count of NLP in the context of love. Okay. So this increment will be reflected in our count matrix. You can see I have incremented this i here and the nlp here now you can see that there is two why because you can see that i comes two times in the context of love but nlp comes only one times that's why here we have two but here i have one so that's how we are going to build the whole co-occurrence matrix now a very interesting property of this co-occurrence matrix is that it is a symmetric matrix well, obviously, because in one instance, the NLP is the context of love, but in another instance, the love will be in the context of NLP. So that's how we got a symmetric matrix. Now come to the sum of the notations because these notations will be helpful for the rest of the part. Okay, so the first thing here is XIJ and this simply means number of times the word j appears in the context of i okay so for example here x i love will be equal to 2 
because love appears two times in the context of the word I. To really understand the power of this co-occurrence matrix, I am going to define another term which is called the probability of the word J appears in the context of I. This is simply defined as the ratio of two terms. In the numerator, we have xij, the same as this one, but in the denominator, we have xi. The formula is actually very simple. It is the summation of all the x i k's and obviously k runs from 0 to the number of words in the vocabulary. What it really means is that the summation of all the column values for a particular row. Okay, x love will be equal to 2 plus 1 plus 1 that is 3. Okay, so this is denoted by probability j slash i. So now comes how we are actually using this probability to show the power of co-occurrence matrix. Well, I'm gonna take the same example that was given in the GLOF paper. So this is how it looks. You can see here I'm computing some of the probabilities and here we have a variable called k and in the columns we are replacing k with a word and in the first row you can see we are computing probability k slash i's and here I have taken k as solid so this value represents the probability of appearing solid in the context of the word ice and if we really count this from a corpus we find that it is high well obviously it will be high because ice is a solid material but whenever we calculate gas with ice it will be low but whenever we are calculating water with ice it will be high again why because water is related to ice and whenever we are computing a random word with the ice so there is no correlation so obviously this probability will be low now in the second row I am just taking steam and there is no relation with solid and steam so it will be low but here it will be high because here we have gas and Notice here that in the water, it will be again high because water is related to both ice and steam. And in the random word again, it will be low. So if you just analyze this first two rows, you can get an idea that, okay, whenever two words are related, there is a high probability. And whenever they are not related, there is a low probability. But what happens when one particular word is related to both the words well in that case we are having a high value so to neutralize this effect what they did they are just taking the ratio of these two probabilities so here we are taking the ratio of probability solid slash ice to the probability solid slash steam you can see in the numerator we have a high value so obviously the result will be a number greater than one but here in the denominator we have a high value so the result will be less than 1. But whenever we are calculating the ratio between two high values or two low values the answer is very close to 1. Okay so I think by giving this example you now can appreciate the power of co-occurrence matrix and hence the power of global statistics. Now there is a big problem if we want to use this co-occurrence matrix in our NLP task and the problem is the dimension of a co-occurrence matrix can be millions especially if you are working with a long corpus so we need to somehow take advantage of the co-occurrence matrix without calculating it directly and that's how the GLOF paper did they introduced word vectors with the co-occurrence matrix and in this way, they actually managed to take advantage of the global property of the dataset and the local property of the dataset. But now the question arises, how the hell are we going to introduce our favorite word vectors in this kind of probabilistic model? Well, here is the most general way of writing this expression. So what we can do, we can take the word vectors of three words. And throughout the video, I'm going to be using this symbol 
to represent a word which is a context word okay and these words are actually the middle words so we can say that if is an arbitrary function and whenever we are giving these three vectors to this function we are gonna be predicting the value of the ratio of the two probabilities so it is the basic concept of this Gloff paper but we have several difficulties to overcome here well the very first difficulty we need to overcome is that in the left hand side of this equation we have vectors but in the right hand side we have a scalar so first we need to somehow convert this word vectors into scalars and the second one is this function takes three arguments and it is very hard to write a cost function with three variables so what we would like to do is we will try to minimize the number of arguments here we have actually another difficulty here is how we can choose this function because there are thousands and thousands of functions that we can apply on vectors so we need to choose a function now i'm going to show you what the researchers did to overcome these difficulties and i'm going to be explaining the intuition behind their approach okay to convert the vectors into scalars we can use a nice property of the vectors which is the dot product so you can see here that they use the dot product of these two vectors and the first vector is actually a vector difference and the intuition behind this vector difference we can gain from the what to vec model as you saw in my last video regarding the what to vec model there was a concept of analogy between words and what i did in that video is to compute the analogies i was subtracting one vector from the other vector and these vector differences are very useful in the nlp task and the transpose sign is written here just to be compatible with the dimensions so that's how we have overcome our first problem now comes the second problem which is to select this function f to limit the number of functions applicable in this case they actually assumed that this function f obeys the homomorphism law let me explain this to you if you know a little bit of group theory then please notice here suppose we have two groups here this is the real number i guess you know and this is one group and you can see this is a plus sign so this is a additive group and we have another group here which is a multiplicative group and we have a function f from this group let me just call it g and call it h from g to h and what the homomorphism says is that f of u plus v should be equal to f of u times f of v so what i have basically done here is that even if we add the two elements from this group and then apply this function the result will be same as in this case where i have first applied the functions on the two elements then i have multiplied them and you can see that these two elements uv actually belong to the group g and whenever we are applying the function f these two elements are being projected on the group h and this is the homomorphism property and if you didn't understand what i have just told then please don't worry about it because this won't be very important for the rest of this video so this was the concept of homomorphism and if we just assume that our function capital f obeys this homomorphism then we can write something like this and here you can see that they have used subtraction and division instead of this addition and multiplication well i hope you know that whenever we can you perform addition we can definitely perform subtraction so that's how they are basically the same thing
and uh, for your better understanding just assume that this part this whole part is u and this whole part is v so now this makes sense so now comes this portion from this line we can write f of wi transpose times wk is equal to a constant times this one but we can safely ignore this c because even if we don't include this c it won't change the form of our relationship luckily our exponentiation function that is f of x is equal to e to the power x is a solution for this homomorphism property so we are taking f as e to the power x all right so we can write this nice thing wi transpose times wk is equal to log of probability of k slash i let me just write a small step here for the better understanding e to the power times equal to okay so now from this line we can definitely get this line all right and from the equation that i have written here we can easily get this formula okay now they have introduced some biases here this is the first bias and this is the second bias and this is for accounting any bias term for this wi and this is for accounting any bias for this term and another interesting thing you can notice here that they have actually absorbed this term in the biases okay so now comes the main portion where i'm going to show you the loss function or the cost function for our glove model okay so this is the cost function don't get afraid i'm going to explain this thing first of all notice that we have only two variables here whereas here we had three variables so what do we do we absorb the third variable well if you notice here when we write this line we only took the numerator portion we are not taking the denominator portion that's how we got rid of the third variable and uh, you can see in the cost function i am taking two variables i and j and the j is acting as the context word and as i have told earlier whenever you see this sign on the head of a variable you should know that this is a context word and this is a middle word so that's how we are going to train the model by just taking the middle word and it context now notice two things here first thing is that here i have taken a square term y well if you just change the side here you will get this thing obviously and for a moment just ignore this term okay so so doesn't it look familiar with the linear regression term which was y minus y hat squared it is a least square function right so exactly that function is used here and fortunately this is a convex function so that will definitely help our model to learn better this term is actually a fancy term and there is no proper theoretical background behind this thing because this is just an arbitrary function they have included here to improve their performance and you can refer to this as interesting heuristics so this is just a function that we multiply with this thing and we optimize this cost function and the v term here i hope you guessed it already that it is just the length of our vocabulary so that was all for the conceptual part and now i'm going to be showing you how you can actually visualize different words using this glove model so let's jump into the code section okay so here i'm using google colab and i will definitely share this google colab 
notebook with you so make sure to check the video description first i'm importing some libraries and i should tell you that this code is actually very similar to my previous code that was for what to vec model so you can actually copy the same code and change some things that i'm gonna tell you okay so after importing the libraries i'm gonna import the gensim downloader and here in the load function i'm gonna pass this thing this is actually the glove word vectors for a wikipedia text and the number of dimensions is 300 okay and i am loading this thing to our variable called glove model and i am then representing one word into its vector form so the word i have taken here is beautiful and if i just scroll down you can see the word is represented as an array that is a vector and after that i'm finding 10 most similar words for a particular word that is given by our model okay so i have written here girl and the similar words that our model have given me is boy woman girls teenager teenage mother boys child teen daughter and you will be amazed to see that the results are very close that we got from the what to vec model and here comes the famous expression and i have explained this expression in my previous video so here uh, it is also giving me king that was given by the what to vec model so we can clearly see that this Gilov model was also able to capture the analogies of the words and the meaning of the words. So now comes the visualization, the coolest part. And here I am using the same vocabulary that I used in the previous video. So you can actually compare the two results. And I will recommend you to add more words in this vocabulary and compare both the models, Gilov and what to vec so the same thing and this is the plot here and you can see the glove model has successfully clustered the fruit words here and the human like words here so that was all for this video i hope you have enjoyed this video please share this video and subscribe to my channel thanks for watching